Let's go. Welcome to the Soul Fam Podcast, where we expand your personal universe. I'm Diana Marchetta, and in each episode, Soul Fam co founder, co creator Lexi Stremer Solden, and I interview the world's most rising and longtime experts in consciousness, spirituality, entertainment, healing, and science from Earth's dimensions and dimensions way, way beyond. On the Soul Fam podcast, our frequencies are high and your heart chakras will open as these powerful voices of today share cutting edge research, profound experiences, and valuable knowledge for your world in this out of this world, thought provoking, envelope pushing interviews that could only take place right here on the Soul Fam Podcast. Welcome to the Soul Fam Podcast. Today, Melanie Clow, founder of Rebel Alchemy, is our guest. Melanie is a therapeutic horseback riding instructor who received her certification in 2011 as an instructor and moved into holistic health coaching and energy work in 2015. Melanie, who is an equestrian, decided to put her love of therapy and horses together in an entirely new way. She integrates horses as teachers and healers to help people raise their emotional intelligence and empower them to transform their work and life through self-mastery, deeper connection, and heightened intuition. Welcome, Melanie. Hi, thank you. <laughs> How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Um, we are, as Lexi said, just getting our way into Sagittarius season. Yep, it's a good uh, a good shift here. <laughs> it's a great shift here. So Sagittarius, obviously mutable fire. Uh, the centaur, half human, half horse. Obviously, the archetype associated with Sagittarius. And we're just sort of briefly discussing um, that the most famous of the centaurs might be Chiron, who's known as the wounded healer. Something else interesting about Chiron is that we had Chiron retrograde in Aries for like five months or six months or something like that. And Chiron will be going direct, I believe, in about a month. So that's that's really interesting. So if you've done a lot of introspection um, over the past five months, starting at the end of December, it might be time to do something practical about your healing. So I thought maybe, Melody, you might have a lot of insight there. Yes, um, it's interesting that he is the wounded healer because most people that become healers, it starts from they themselves having whatever traumatic experiences or, you know, your wounds that you are trying to heal. And you learn so much more about <laughs> just all the different ways to heal. Um, so yeah, I think it's good timing. <laughs> so Melanie, could you share with us a little bit about what you do? Um, coincidentally, Melanie and I are both equestrians. I have a horse. She has two horses, which she, whom she rescued. And um, I'm sure there's a story behind all of that, but I'd love to share with our listening audience exactly what you do and how you do it. Okay. So what I do is called um, equine facilitated learning and coaching. It's pretty much just putting together, working with horses and being able to use them as a mirror of your own energy. Um, a lot of us are very unaware of the energy that we're actually putting out into the world. You know, you probably go to work, you put a smile on your face, but in reality, you're just kind of like shooting daggers at all the people around you because you really don't like them or they made a weird comment. And so the horse really brings forward these hidden energies that we've just learned to push down and actually really be aware of them 
and in some cases heal from them and just be more authentic, you know, in the world, which just makes everyone more comfortable around you anyway. So how is it that the horses actually sort of reflect us then? Are they sort of mirrors of ourselves then? Yeah, they can mirror the energy back to you. They can um, react strongly to the energy you're putting out. Um, I could give an example. I had one client come in. She didn't really know what she wanted to even get out of the healing. She just knew she was drawn to it. She actually rode horses and, um, she, we talked for a while about her moving and changing jobs and blah, blah, blah. And so we're like, well, let's just see what the horses do in reaction to you. So we go in, start the session and the horse that I noticed started getting very pushy with her. And she just stood there and was fine with it. And I was like, do you realize, you know, how strongly this horse is starting to, you know, just making me uncomfortable. (laughs) And she immediately comes out with how her partner is upset that she allows people to get too physical with her when they go out. And, uh, and, you know, is a big issue in their relationship. And so we got into that. And if it wasn't for the horse, we never would have got there, you know, because I, I can't see what she's really hiding down in there. It's just what she on the surface wants to talk about. But the horse is just sitting there and I can kind of respond to the horse and read the horse what she's doing and then ask questions. And so we learned a lot about boundaries setting that day and how important it is to have boundaries and how you're still lovable if you have boundaries. And this whole session unfolded that had nothing to do with what we even talked about in the beginning. Wow. So do you use your own horses in this? Do you have to have a horse yourself to do it? Is it, do you have to be a horse person? Uh, You don't have to be a horse person. I use my horses. Um, If you do have your own horse, we could do a session with them, but sometimes it's easier if um, a person comes and uses my horses that they don't already have a relationship with. So it's kind of like a clean slate Um, cause with your own horse, you kind of have already established how you guys react together. And even if you don't maybe like the way it's going, and that's why you want to do this work, it's already established. So if you come work with a new horse, you can see these new ways of working. And, uh, my mare actually is, has turned out to be a fantastic, um, coach. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about your horses, um, whom I've met and ridden with, but tell yeah. us a little bit about your horses and then and then why I'm super curious also why you feel so comfortable having people who maybe aren't familiar with horses at all be around yours. Okay. Well, I I've actually been around horses my entire life. I've taught riding to kids at a kids camp. I was the director there. Um, I took care of all 30 horses and ponies. Then I moved into um equine or sorry, uh therapeutic horseback riding, which was more, a lot more of the physical aspects. Um, so we had people, you know, with different health problems or kids that had autism or cerebral palsy, and we used it to help with their walking and their talking and all that stuff. So I did that for a long time. And then I started, uh, my holistic health journey, which is a whole other thing with nutrition and yoga and energy work. And while I did that, I continued to work with a dressage trainer. Um, and then I started volunteering at a horse rescue. And uh, that's where I worked with a bunch of horses that were in severe neglect situations. So I learned how to work with horses and kind of bring them back to help them come back to being a horse. You know, some of them were you know left in a stall for years and not touched and unhandled. So um So once I saw that and how I learned so much about myself working with these horses, um, I decided to put that together. And so when I got my horses, the first one I got, she, um, she was a ex race horse and went into a jumping program and she had really sore feet, but no one paid attention to that. They just, every time she would act out, they treated her like she was bad you know, and trying to punish her and then she'd fight back and then they'd put her away and give her treats. So then she got an attitude problem <laughs> and she was a mess when I got her, her nickname was actually kid killer. <laughs> wow. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so I was like, I'll, I'll see what I can do, you know? Um, 
so I, I don't go into it with the goal of, you know, showing or jumping or doing these things. It was really just to get to know the horse and see where the problem was. And, you know, I fixed her attitude problem within like a week <laughs> and then figured out that her feet were sore and I got a shoer. He helped me and now she's great. And sometimes she still has problems, but I recognize it and I can give her butte and give her time off and she's totally fine. Um, so it's just, you know, listening to what the horse is trying to tell you instead of having an agenda and then going into it. And, uh, you know, I put different people with her, my own kids and everyone, and she's fantastic. And then, you know, I practice the work on myself first to see how they would react when I'm trying to do all these different energy work with myself. And she's just, she's so great. <laughs> I'm picturing Robert Redford in The Horse Whisperer. I mean... <laughs> That's I'm picturing like the slow, gentle. I mean, is that is that accurate or is that I mean, with your approach, I mean, you said it took you a week. I'm trying to figure out how it only took you a week and not, you know, six months. It sounds like there was a lot going on. Yeah, the whole training process takes a long time, but just to fix their attitude and establish respect can take a very short amount of time because it took, you know, however long for the kids to get scared of her and just put her away when she was bad for her to learn. Oh, Hey, that's all I have to do is buck a little and they'll put me away and give me treats. <laughs> and then she would just, you know, pull the kids all over the place and go wherever she wanted. Cause they didn't want to tell her no. So it was just really a matter of establishing the boundary. We call it, you know, your hula hoop space. Basically they can do whatever they want outside of their hula hoop space. But if they want to be invited in, to be calm and relaxed, then they have to act calm and relaxed. So it's just kind of a give and take. There's a lot of um, round pen and groundwork that I think gets skipped over in a lot of um, horse training uh, that is so good to establish, you know, boundaries and who, you know, because a horse can freak out and they're huge and it's scary. But if you make it a point that they do it over there away from you and then they can stop working and come hang out with you, then they are like, oh, all I have to do is be have <laughs> or be kind and calm and I can just stand in the middle and not have to work. And so once you kind of get how they think, it's a little easier. <laughs> Lexi, have you had some experience? Also, Lexi also is an equestrian. She grew up riding and I love horses. Yeah. And, <laughs> and were there are there other experiences that you were mentioning previously about working with children? Well, I just know that um horse equine therapy is really big, as you mentioned, in the sort of special needs community with kids. Mm -hmm. And when I think a lot of funding in Los Angeles was cut maybe five or six years ago, and it was a huge deal because so many of um, just a huge portion of the autistic community amongst, you know, children in LA was, is, you know, nonverbal. That doesn't mean obviously that you can't communicate, but Having that relationship with the horse and having that continued support, that was just a vital part of their ongoing therapies. So I just remember what a big deal it was when it looked like a lot of the equine therapy uh, funds were going to be cut. I think they've since righted that for the, the people who absolutely vitally need it to keep going. But I know it's been so effective for so many kids, and it's something that I would love my own kids to try. Um, they are freaked out by how big the horses are. Um, I have to, I have to say, I remember cleaning the back feet, you know, with the, with the pick or whatever. And I was like, just be calm, just be calm. It's going to be fine. And I do remember having my riding instructor telling me to just get off the horse one day. I was like, what, what's wrong? Is, is shaman getting spooked? That was the horse shaman. She's like, no, it's, uh, it's you. You're, you're kind of all over the place today. You're all over the place and shaman is freaked out and this isn't going to work. So you just need to get out, get off, go sit down. She still wasn't happy with how all over the place I was. And she's like, just, you got to come back next week. So that, I mean, even then I remember there being some sort of relationship between my energy and the horse's energy. I remember my writing teacher identified it, but I, I still, um, I, I didn't know exactly how it worked other than 
And it's like the reverse of what you were talking about, Melanie. If the horse is calm, then they can come into your circle. What my writing teacher did was, okay, Lexi, if you're calm and not all over the place, Shaman will let you into his circle and you can ride. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense because they're herd animals. So that's how they relate to each other. And that's their rules for each other as well. So, you know, you'll get a young, a young guy coming in and kind of, you know, picking on everyone or seeing who he can get a reaction out of. And then the elders of the herd, you know, kick him out basically and say, no, that is not acceptable. We're over here grazing, which is what we do. And you can go be, you know, your crazy self over there. And then when he's ready, he can come back and they, you know, have different signals they give each other. Like, okay, you can come back and join the group now. And that's how they, that's how they learn. (laughs) What are the signals? Uh, There's various signals, but a lot have to do with um, showing like the side of themselves. That's the most vulnerable part of the horse is down their side, you know, because in the front and the back, they can kick, they can bite, they can do all those things. So their vulnerable side is on the side of them. And so when they say, okay, you can come in, they'll usually uh, turn their side to you or kind of turn away. So if you ever did any round pen work and you turn away from the horse and that tells them it's okay to come in, that's the same kind of signal. You're saying, okay, I don't have to keep my eye on you and possibly kick you. (laughs) I can turn away. And now that means, okay, you can come in. They also do a lot of signals with their ears. You can tell where their focus is by where their ears are pointing. Um, If they have to get too extreme, you know, that's when the teeth come out and maybe some kicks or some stomps come in. Uh, So you don't want them to do that with you. But that's why we usually use like a lunge line to keep them kind of away from your space until you can trust them and know that they can come in. And then on the other side of that, what would be considered aggressive behavior from a human where you may not even know you're doing it, like making direct eye contact or like what would a human do maybe, you know, accidentally that could be considered aggressive behavior for a horse yeah to a horse yeah so some of it it could be completely internal it could be how you hold your posture could be kind of tight and rigid maybe you're trying to make yourself look bigger and you don't realize it you could even feel totally normal to yourself but they can just read your energy Um, And they will turn away from you or react towards you. Um, A lot of people don't realize they have aggressive energy and horses can pick that up without even needing to see your body language. That helps. Body language helps, but they don't even need to see that. They are have such a strong ability to sense the energy that you're putting out that they know what's going on internally but it's, it's how they survive, right? So if they're in a field and let's say there's a mountain lion coming and he's on the hunt, he's hungry without even looking at him, they just sense the energy changes in that field. And then they look, and if they see him and he's kind of crouching, ready to go, they all run. (laughs) On the other hand, if they're in the field, they sense the mountain lion, but his energy's calm. He just went and ate, you know, a deer or something. He's full. He's not looking for anyone to eat all the horses stay where they are they can totally read that he's not in the mood to hunt (laughs) so what were you telling me earlier about a horse's heart and the horse's electromagnetic field Mm -hmm. Is, is that related to their sense of reading your energy yes so um A lot of you that are into energy work probably know about our energetic field, and it's kind of based around our heart center. Horses' hearts are huge. I'm not, I don't remember exactly how big, but maybe 10 times the size of our heart at least. And so that means their electromagnetic field is 10 times the size of them. (laughs) So they, um, they can sense things that are in that electromagnetic field, as well as a lot of times people will feel like when they're around horses, they don't know why, but they just sense this, this feeling of calm, or they just feel healed being around them. That's because you're in their energetic field, in their heart field. And that is helping to make your heart kind of, I guess, beat at the same rate, you know? So if they're calm, grazing we call it their like grazing state when they're that's the way they want to be is just calm and grazing so when you're around a horse that's doing that it brings your body 
um, chemistry into a calm state as well. Hmm. So when you bring a client there, and I'm curious about your clients as well, when you bring a client there, do you, and I, I know we just sort of talked about this, but do you diagnose your clients as they are working with the horse? Yeah, I mostly do coaching, so I don't necessarily diagnose them. I just um, bring them in with the horse and see how the horse behaves around them. And then I can ask questions, you know, based on what the horse is doing. And then those questions hopefully will trigger in them, oh, I know what that relates to, you know, because sometimes they don't even know what they're going in for. Like with the client I described, you know, I saw my horses being pushy and she usually, you know, she reacts differently to everyone, but that's not how she normally is with me. And so I noticed I was like, I'm like, she's getting pretty pushy and you're not doing anything <laughs> to stop her. And she was like, oh, you know, and then it was like, oh, I kind of do that in life, you know, and it's true. You know, I didn't have to say anything. She came up with it right away. I was just explaining the situation that was happening. Mm, so that's really kind of, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so what have been the results? Um, uh, you, you know, you've described one client. Um, I'm just curious what some other challenges are that clients have brought to you or what some other challenges are that have kind of come up as you're working with your horses, with your clients. Um, a lot of stuff people come to me about, it's usually they feel like they're not showing up in the world in the way that they want to, you know, I just, I can't get this promotion at work and I don't know why I'm working hard. I can't, I keep getting in like the same relationship over and over again and just doesn't work out and things like that. They can't always put their finger on what it is. They just see this pattern maybe that isn't working for them. And so they know they want to change. They feel drawn to this work and, you know, they get brave and make the call and then they come in and realize, oh, like I'm not. I'm not getting that promotion because I'm really shy. I just sit back and let, you know, I do all the work and sit back, but I don't, you know, come out there and be like, Hey, look at me. <laughs> like I'm doing all this work <laughs> or they don't ask for what they want. That's a huge one. People don't, you know, don't ask for what they want. Um, they're worried that someone, you know, with the horse, they're worried the horse is going to get mad at them for asking them to move out of their space or asking them to walk you know, I have so many clients that say, oh, um, I'm like, well, are you okay with what they're doing right now? Oh yeah, it's fine. <laughs> like really? Cause that's not what you asked him to do. <laughs> so then we get into that and it's like, oh, all I have to do is just ask a little, maybe if they don't respond a little bit stronger, I'm not hurting anybody and I'm, they're not going to hold a grudge against me. I just have to, you know, really be clear and get my point across. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like such a great way to practice boundaries and, you know, self advocating because I don't know what it is. I mean, I'm identifying so much, so much with what you're talking about. And no, 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 it's fine. It'll be fine. Part of that, I mean, you could look at it as people pleasing. You could look at it as being a team player or just trying to keep your head down and get the job done. And maybe you were on a sports team and you just, you hurt yourself and you had to suck it up and just get through it. And it was fine. So I think a lot of people have maybe come into adulthood and realized like, no, I actually don't have to be fine with that. And it doesn't have to be the biggest deal in the world, but I, I don't have to be okay with it. Um, and it is very awkward to practice doing that with, uh, I don't know, colleagues, family, people in the world. Because, you know, you almost it's like, here I am, I am setting a boundary. And it's like, well, that's really awkward. I could see that working with a horse, like you said, they're not going to judge you. They're not going to hold a grudge. They're just going to be very matter of fact about it. And that probably gives you some, you know, muscle memory, some reps, some practice doing it. Yeah, that's exactly right. They um, So not only can they show you if you don't exactly know what's going on, but some of us feel like we know what's going on and we can talk about it till our face is blue, but we don't know how to change it or how it feels to do that. So when you come in with the horse, you can actually feel what it's like in your body and in your energetic body, how to set boundaries, how to ask for what you want and how to be okay, you know, asking for that stuff. <laughs> and so it's, um, yeah, it's just, it's amazing to watch people do that. And then we just practice and practice 
and it just becomes more natural to do it in, um, in the real world. And I found that with myself too, you know, I, I was completely the same way. I had no boundaries, you know, it was like, Oh, I just wanted to people please. Okay. You know, I'll do whatever you want. I just want to keep the peace. You know, I don't want to ask for anything. I just want it to be peaceful and okay. And I'd rather just go disappear than deal with it. And working with the horse, it taught me, I mean, it taught me how to break all of those habits and patterns and just come in and be like, nope, we're going to do this until we get it right. <laughs> and um, I'm going to set these boundaries and I'm going to be okay with the outcome. And if you're going to freak out, that's fine. You can do that over there. <laughs> and then when we're ready, we'll come back together. So what are some things that you recommend to people if they're curious about this kind of therapy or this kind of work, I should say, perhaps therapy is not the right term, but this kind of work what would you suggest that they do? Should they, um, cause I, I bet people are pretty curious about how to go about this and how to reach you. Yeah. So, um, if they just want to learn about stuff, there's lots of books out there. That's how I got started actually. Um, and this part, you know, cause I was doing all the holistic work. I was doing the coursework and I was like, there has to be a way to connect it. And then I found books where people were doing that. And so for me, um, I now offer different programs that you can do, um, different lengths of time, depending if you want to just come in and get your feet wet, or if you want to do like a full half day session and really like get through some things. Um, are you wanting my website and, uh, yeah, that's it. That'd be okay. great. Uh, my website is, uh, rebel-alchemy.com. Um, and that will take you on. You can even uh, schedule an appointment through there. I also offer, you know, 15 minute free consultations if you just want to talk to me and get a little more in depth just to feel if this is right for you. I found in my own healing that if you feel drawn to something, it's really worth checking out, even if you don't know why you're drawn to it or it doesn't make sense. I'm starting, I'm starting to really learn how to trust my own intuition. I'm like, oh, that is you know, putting up a flag for me. Why? Let's go check it out. Because I have, I have healed myself so much just following those little threads <laughs> of ideas. Um, so it's, it's been totally worth it. <laughs> and could you tell us just a quickly, a little story about your horses and how you came to rescue them and why you felt, I'm curious if you felt intuitively that your horses could assist you in your journey as well as other people's. Yeah, actually, when I first got my, my first horse, uh, I just wanted a horse and I wanted to rescue her, uh, one because, you know, after I did worked at the volunteering for the horse rescue, I was like, I'm not going to buy a horse. I want to save, you know, help wherever I can. So, um, I went and saw a bunch of different horses and people wanted, you know, different prices and then they had different training and, and, uh, I found her and she was <laughs> the worst one. <laughs> she was just a mess, you know, kid killer. Right. So, um, I was like, she's the one I just intuitively was like, everyone was like, why would you get that one? <laughs> and so I was like, but she's the one. And so I got her and then, um, I started doing this work actually a year later, um, specifically with the horses and the coaching. And, um, just as I've done it, I've realized like, this is why I intuitively just knew that I had to have her, you know, cause it's, it's been a struggle here and there. He, she has issues and we've worked through them and I love her to death, but now I can see like, this is why I was so attracted to her because she's so good at this. And then my gelding that I have, I actually had another gelding before rescued off of, you know, he was going to go be on a meat truck and, uh, uh, then he ended up in someone's backyard and he was kind of neglected. And so I got him and, um, he had a lot of issues. We worked through, you know, same thing. He would rear all the time. <laughs> um, so we got through that and then, uh, he just had a lot of health issues. So I ended up rehoming him. He found a home as a companion horse. He gets to hang out in a grassy field. So I felt that was a better situation for him. And then I got my third horse that I have now, and he was what's called Charo Broke, um, which is not a nice way 
to train horses, he was kind of a mess. He was super nervous about everything. You couldn't even pick up a rope without him, you know, backing up a hundred miles with his head in the air. And then he'd just start shaking because he was just terrified of ropes. It was terrible. So we worked through all that. And now his personality is starting to come through. And um, he's starting, he started a little after my mare, but now he's starting to do some of the coaching sessions and he's doing a really good job. And it's funny because they, <laughs> they react opposite to people for the same thing. Like, so if someone comes in and they're really insecure and shy and don't have boundaries, my gelding's all over them. And my mare has wants nothing to do with them. And if they come in and they're like confident, know what they're doing, my mare's all over them and my gelding wants nothing to do with them. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> wow. They really are truth tellers. They are a hundred percent. Interesting. So Melanie, tell us some more about, I'm super curious how you got to this and um, your holistic healing journey. Because I I think I find also that when we share ourselves with others, they can relate to it. So I'm curious how your holistic healing journey kind of started and and then grew to become part of the horse world as well. Okay. You don't mind me asking. (laughs) No, not at all. So, um... Obviously, healing is a huge journey. So mine started a long time ago, and it's kind of like aha moments, I guess. Uh, I did a cleanse with my friend uh, when we lived together probably 15 years ago and just realized how important organic food was and how important it was to, you know, put good things into your body instead of just eating whatever. So that was my first kind of aha moment. Then I went through a sort of uh, traumatic relationship experience. And from that, I ended up getting really physically sick. Um, So it took a while for me to realize it, but I just started getting sicker and sicker. I kept going to doctors, you know, saying there's something wrong. And I had acid reflux for like no reason. So they gave me pills Uh, you know, there's no reason why it's just, oh, just acid reflux. And then, you know, I was having bowel issues and hormone issues. And it would all seem like it was, you know, snowballing and getting worse and worse. And every time I'd go back and get uh, blood tests and whatever else they would say, oh, you're fine. You know, you're still within range. Um, And so I was like, I know I'm getting sicker and I could look, you know, because I had three blood tests over six years because I kept telling them to do it. And they, uh, I could see on some of them, I didn't know what they meant, because, you know, I'm I'm not a doctor, I didn't know what it meant. But there were some that started, you know, in the top of the range, and then we're now in the bottom of the range over six years. And I was like, well, what are those? And they're like, but they're in range, that means you're fine. So I started turning to more holistic uh, medicine. And that's when I got into yoga for exercise and for stress. Um, I was working on the mind body connection and trying to heal that way. And it wasn't until I found a holistic, not a holistic, a um, functional medicine practitioner. So it was more Eastern medicine ideas. And they did tests and, you know, said I was in stage three adrenal fatigue. I had picked up the stomach bacteria that was keeping me from digesting nutrients, which is why my body was failing because I wasn't getting any nutrients. Um, And so it took probably like a year and a half to come back from that. Um, And meanwhile, I was still doing the physical part, but I never really got into much of the spiritual part. And I still wasn't healing (laughs) enough. (laughs) And so I finally got into the spiritual part. I do a shamanic journey work now. um, And it just opened up this whole new part of you have to heal your mind, your body and your spirit. And sure, you could do spiritual work and you could end up seeing a physical healing from it. Um, But as they say in your energy body, when something traumatic happens, it might be like a black spot in your energy body. And then if it doesn't get taken care of or removed, it starts to manifest itself as disease in your body. And so a lot of times we just start to heal the body or the mind. It could also be in the mind. So we start to heal the body or the mind or the body and the mind, but we never took care of that original black spot in the spiritual body. So you can never fully heal. 
So I now do all of those things and, um, I'm getting much healthier (laughs) and feeling really good. And I've just, I've noticed a ton of shift in patterns and, um, it's just been, it's been amazing to see, uh, how the three work together and, um, and that I guess the most important thing I learned is that there's no quick fix. You know, everyone wants to get a pill or do that one exercise that makes you thin or do it, it, that is not at all how it is. <laughs> you have to do, you know, your meditation practice or maybe a grateful practice in the morning. You have to eat healthy and treat your body like a temple and put good things into your body, you know. And you have same thing with your mind. You have to put good things into your mind. (laughs) You can't dwell or focus on the bad in the world. You have to realize that you can, you know, change yourself and your patterns and your life and you'll start to attract those similar energies. And although there's still things you don't like in the world or around you, you know how to create this inner landscape of peace and you can move into that and not manifest disease in yourself. So yeah. how, how did horses come? Sorry, Lexi, how did the <laughs> horses come to be part of all that? Um, so during that whole time, you know, I, I worked with horses my whole life and throughout that whole process, I've been working with them. And I, I just think, um, seeing their spirituality and their healing and everything also being able to practice, um, how I show up in the world with them and um, not being judged by them. I also can just go hang out with them and, you know, meditate with them for a while. And they'll just provide me with all that healing space. Um, So I think what I want uh, to share with people is being able to experience the whole spectrum of mind, body, spirit, healing, and be able to practice it in the world with horses. um, And just see you know, how you can show up differently and how you can bring more peace into your life and how great it really feels. <laughs> Very I think cool. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And all I was going to say is, I, I mean, just as a student of Hermeticism, like, oh yeah, like as within, so without, as above, so below. You work on yourself and you start to see changes in the real world. And no, it's not overnight, but little by little, you start to see the results of some of the work that you're doing. And when I was thinking of, for me, what would be the connection to horses? It sort of led me to the idea of just nature in general and how plugging into that life force, even if you're just laying on the grass somewhere or watching the horses graze or staring at a flower. um, No, it's not going to fix everything, but allowing yourself to be part of the whole of that sort of nature and its great beating heart and every part of it, you can't, this is a double negative, you can't not heal. There's right. there's something that's going to propel you forward in your healing simply by participating in life. Mm-hmm. And journey work and shamanic practice is very much around um, nature and being in nature and learning from nature. Like everything is already happening in nature in the perfect way that it's supposed to happen. So being able to just kind of shut your mind off to the thinking or analytical part and just be able to feel the flow and take lessons from the rushing river or the birds flying up above or just being able to stop and watch and be a part of nature is really healing for people. So So what's your overall goal, Melanie, both for sort of your work with rebel alchemy, and then do you have a secondary goal? Yes. So I, my main goal to get to is to have property, um, a big piece of property where I can have my horses and rescue more horses Um, I'd really like to have rescue horses working with people that, you know, feel that they need to work on stuff. So horses can help humans find their path and where they fit in the world. And humans can help the horses find their path and where they fit in the world. Um, And then I also want it to be a farm where people can come and learn how to grow their own food and cook it and how important it is for us not only 
to take what's good from the earth and put it into our body, but put good back into the earth so that we can just continue this cycle and be able to be sustainable and nurture each other because that's how it was always meant to be. <laughs> so with the composting, I actually volunteer at a farm right now because that's the next uh, step that I want to do is the farming part. So some of you have probably heard of the biggest little farm or apricot lane farms. They had a, a movie on Netflix, maybe. Um, so I'm volunteering with them. They're fully biodynamic, which means they uh, put, what is it? They take like their scraps and put it into compost. They put the compost back into the earth and then they take the produce from that. There's animals involved. It's called a closed system. So it's where we are nurtured by the earth and then we nurture the earth right back. And so that is what I am trying to help teach. And then with the horses, you know, the horses help heal us while we help heal the horses. It's all a closed system. And, um, and I think that's just how it was always meant to be. <laughs> it's very cool. Yeah. To improve the soil composition so we can have healthier vegetables and healthier food. Um, mm -hmm. That sort of exchange between um, earth and human and, and also with animal and human. Mm -hmm. Very cool. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I didn't know that also, Melanie, I'm now I really have a, a thousand questions. So and we'll have to reconnect about all of that. Cause that's another aspect that I'm super curious about uh, regenerative farming and, um, you know, healing the earth as it heals ourselves. Mm-hmm. Definitely. <laughs> um, tell me, what's your overall goal with, with your clients? I guess my goal would be just to help them realize how powerful they can be for themselves. And uh, so many people rely on other people's opinions of them, of how to move through life. And the most important thing I think we can do is be able to just take our power back and be strong and confident in who we are and um, accepting of other people for who they are. I think that leads to happiness. And that's what I want for as many people as I can talk to, I guess. Beautiful. Well, for our city listeners, um, I, for instance, didn't know that you could volunteer at a farm. But um, if you wanted to get started in a small way, and you're interested and sort of learning more of this in addition to maybe contacting you and setting up a consultation or starting your own compost composting bin. Um, what are some small ways that a city person who's maybe working full time in a building, what are some ways that person can sort of get into nature a little bit? What would you recommend? Um, so in my shamanic journey work, we do stuff as simple as going and finding your favorite tree that's closest to your house. And honestly, just taking a walk there once a day, twice a day, however much you need, and just sitting with that particular tree. There's also, you know, parks where you can find trees. Um, obviously, people are busy. Sometimes there's trees near where you work, but it's really it can start out that simple. There's also ways of just growing maybe a few herbs in your uh, in your apartment or house or wherever um, and having a small composting situation um, that you could have on your counter. They've got little ones that fit on your counter. They've got ones that fit in your backyard. And in just that small way, you can already start to increase the nutrients that go into, let's say, your parsley or your basil that you use in some of your meals. Um it doesn't have to be huge scale, you know, not everyone can do that. But in little ways, you'll start to notice, um, you'll feel a difference. Because um, we absorb, you know, everything that's around us, not just food, not just what we put on ourselves. We absorb the television shows that we watch. We absorb the posters that we see, the YouTube videos that we see. Um, so if we make a conscious effort to change those things to align with where we want to go or how we want to be in the world, then you're going to notice huge shifts just from changing your environment. So true. <laughs> Lexi, you have a favorite tree, Thank right? Thank you. I do. Of course. I have lots of favorite trees. Yes. It's hard to pick one, but usually the closest one, the easiest one to get to, you know, if you don't have a lot of time. <laughs> That's true. That's really good advice too. So it, it sounds like no effort is too small um, to make, to make a difference, to make a little difference. And of course, 
making small changes can lead to bigger changes. And we shouldn't get discouraged if we um, are not able to volunteer on a farm or create a huge composting thing. We can have a little potted plant and just sort of work on that and take a walk to our favorite tree sometimes and that's how we can start to to make our way back. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Melanie. This was yeah. amazing. Thank you, Melanie. I'm really curious to learn more. So I hope we we can get together again and talk further about your work with regenerative farming and soil conservation and horses and and, and learn even more about your work with horses and the journey that you're making. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Soul Fam podcast. Be sure to tune in to every episode where we dive into a different rabbit hole of the known and unknown to empower you in conscious living and exploration of the greater universe. We hope you leave each episode with a little stardust in your hair and inspiration in your heart with love from your soul fam.